Good evening, everyone. It's so good to see new faces and old faces here tonight. Um, I am Adrian Northington, Executive Director of the Foundation of Wayne Community College, and I welcome each of you to the Foundation's Fall 2022 Lecture Series. Tonight's lecture, A Holocaust Survivor Remembers, an interview with Renee Fink, is our William S. Bretman Lecture. Bill Bretman was the Foundation's first Arts and Humanities Director, and upon his retirement, the Foundation created a lecture series in his honor. We can thank Bill tonight for recommending Ray, Renee as our speaker. So I ask you, how many of you here tonight can actually say you've met a Holocaust survivor? Renee Fink's story is important to hear and one you will not forget. It is about courage, resistance, and goodness of the people in the 1940s Holland and why those traits remain so very important today. Interviewing Renee tonight is Wayne Community College's very own Allison Daly, one of our talented English faculty members. Allison has two decades of experience at the university, public school, and community college level. Not only is she an English instructor at Wayne Community College, she also is coordinator for the Scholars of Global Distinction Program here at Wayne Community and global education leader with UNC Chapel Hill Worldview. She is also an ambassador for the Fulbright Teachers for Global Classrooms and an alumna of the Teaching Excellence and Achievement Program with the U.S. State Government. So before you meet both of these ladies, let us begin by framing our interview with a clip of a documentary that Renee recorded for the Center of Holocaust Genocide and Human Rights Education of North Carolina Incorporated. This will set the stage for the interview. And before we begin, just silence your phones, please. Thank you and enjoy the lecture.
welcome Allison Daly and Renee Fink for this conversation. Good evening. I thank all of you for hosting this moment with us as we make space to listen to our honored guest, Renee Fink. I have a friend in the audience, Jill, who says, do not worry about who is coming. She always tells me this before every presentation. The people who are, are supposed to hear the message will come. Oh. Renee's story needs an audience who will listen with their heart and carry it out in their daily lives. By coming tonight, you became that audience. Thank you. After Renee and I met on um, August 9th, I wrote down, Renee is amazing, really. <laughs> Bright, agile, fully alive, and honest. She lights up when she talks about her grandmother. Just watch. <laughs> but you will also hear what it was like to live in Nazi-occupied Holland from the German invasion in 1940 until its liberation in 1945. You will hear what as a small child she came to believe was normal. And you will hear about the loving family who kept her safe throughout the war. Thank you, Renee, for being with us tonight. <laughs> How are you feeling this evening? I'm feeling fine, but I, I apologize in advance because my voice seems to come and go, it has a will of its own. But I do want to thank first Bill Bretman and whatever role he played in having me come here. It's really my honor and my pleasure. And I thank Adrian Northington and Allison Daly ever, ever so much. I also met Charlotte Brow and she is here. Um, we had lunch together and had a wonderful time. And so now we're just going to have a conversation. Yes. So um, to pick up right where we left off with the wonderful, Van wonderful Vanderbrink family who took you in, mm -hmm. I, but we don't know yet how you even got to their house. Can you tell us how you got how, there? How I came to their house. I'm sorry that um, time makes it impossible for you to see the other three chapters of this video, which was all done based on a very one-time interview, just like this. Mm -hmm. And they, they added, they edited. Um, and we'll this. make it available for them as okay, well. Okay, it's on Google. Uh, so if you see the other three chapters, it will become a little more ava uh, available to you how I got there was a puzzle to me um, because I was all of four years old and my mother and father uh, saw me off on the back of a stranger's bicycle. And since then, in more recent times, I uh, came to the conclusion that uh, the person taking me on her bike was of course, an underground worker. In Holland, we call the resistance movement the underground. So that's, that's how I would refer to them, but I don't want you to be puzzled. I went on her bike without explanation, uh, with no knowledge, and I found myself in a house, you know, to a four-year-old child, everything is larger than life. And the uh, house was empty, but it seemed large. And little by little, as the day went on, people began to arrive, but I don't, didn't know who they were or why I was there. And I never did have an explanation because, as you would see in the, in the a subsequent chapter of the film, knowledge was dangerous. And you don't tell a four-year-old child anything because they cannot censor what they might say. So ignorance was a way of life, a complete ignorance, because everything was dangerous. So I don't know if that answers your yeah. question. Well, and, and information was dangerous even for members of the underground, correct? Absolutely. It's so correct. They all had false names. My aunt and uncle were in the underground, and my aunt had a series 
names that would make you laugh. And one was, oh God, I, I don't remember their names. But it was so funny, and I did write it down some, somewhere. Uh, like Citronella von Schatten, <laughs> something or other. And that was just one of many, many names. Uh, they were cogs with little jobs. No one knew the whole operation because that would possibly be placing a great number of lives at risk. Uh, lives were at risk every minute of every day for the course of the war. So um, one person might just deliver things to a household. Uh, if they were hiding people, they might bring ration, extra ration stamps or books. Uh, they might be printing some newsletter. They could be transporting people uh, or sneaking them to places. I don't know what all they were doing. So tell us a little about the Vanderbrink family. You show up as a four-year-old, and this is not a small family. No, it's not a small <laughs> family. And to my eyes, they looked like very large people. They were not people I was accustomed to seeing because they were very big-boned, and I was tiny. They were not necessarily bleached blonde types, but their hair was far, far lighter than mine. I had almost black eyes and very dark brown hair. So I didn't really look like them. And the idea was to fit in and uh, otherwise just not be too visible. So um, as they came into the house, I was so homesick and so shy I was, by nature, a very shy child, and um, I really didn't, I, I lost my speech and my appetite. I, I just wanted to be home. And little by little, this family came to be my most beloved family. And well after the war ended, I had to leave them, but I stayed with them not only throughout the war, but till after, after it ended, because people had to get back on their feet. And even though I went to live with my grandmother eventually, she had to have a place to live, and all this had to be arranged. But when the time came, I didn't want to part with the Funderbrakes. <laughs> and then I said to my grandmother, when we, we came to this god-awful little house, where um, it was very cold. You have to keep in mind we didn't have heat, no central heat, which, I mean, it was the 40s. The whole world didn't have central heat. But because of the war, we had no electricity, and uh, we pumped water from outside. And I, I was a very good water pumper. <laughs> <laughs> I also fed the chickens and collected chicken eggs. Um, and I had lots of little chores. But when I went to live with my grandmother after the war, our house was so damp and so cold. There, I, I had a bedroom, which is very luxurious, but there were mushrooms or fungus growing on all the walls of my bedroom in the dampness. So I think it must have smelled good, <laughs> like being in a forest. And <laughs> That's funny, the things you remember. <laughs> yeah. um, when you think, I, I don't, I'm sure that most of us here probably consider what would make us, you know, how would we decide that, to part with our child? I wanted to tell you, I'm so glad you asked that because I wanted to tell you that it's a great honor to have been invited to this Bill Bretman lecture. I, I feel deeply honored, and I'm very happy to be here. But in addition to that, it's a miracle for me to be here. If you think that I'm a child survivor, I'm a hidden child survivor, and 
I, it, it gives me an opportunity to speak for one and a half million children who didn't survive. And you know, I mean, I don't think there are small children in this audience. I can say that the Germans wouldn't even waste a bullet to kill a Jewish child. We weren't worth a bullet. They would just kill us by banging our heads against a brick wall. I mean, um, one and a half million children in Nazi-occupied Europe did not survive. They were murdered. So um, out of that, all the children entering the time of the Second World War and the Holocaust, only six or seven percent of them survived. So it's quite amazing that, you know, I'm among those few, and having been a hidden child, I'm still alive to tell about it, even though people are rewriting history and denying the Holocaust and revising it to their own taste. So one of the things about being a child survivor is that there was a difference between being completely hidden and being hidden in plain sight, like like you were. Yeah. So what is what is the difference? Well, it, it's it's a difference I made. I, <laughs> I don't think this is anything official. It's it's what I the the conclusions that I'm drawing are that I I have friends I've met through hidden child conferences. They're international. So I, I realized after meeting a number of others that we have very different stories. And I was very lucky to have a family, a family who loved me. Um, they were not demonstrative. It, it wasn't a family where you got hugs. In fact, one of my brothers, Gerard, who subsequently had 13 children. Oh. It was a very good Catholic family. Um, <laughs> he, he was quite angry about his childhood. Now, I break into a smile when I think of Papa and Mama van der Brink and what they risked and, and what they were for me and how wonderful. Well, Papa, Mama died in the middle of a bombing which was in itself a very traumatic incident. Incident, mm -hmm. uh, yes. more than an incident, is something you never forget. But Papa took me in, and no matter how strict he was with his own children, and he was rather fearful. I mean, you would be fearful. Uh, he fed me which he never did for his children. And Gerard, one of my five Catholic brothers, said to me um, before he died, um, they would all come and visit me in the United States, and they would stay for three weeks at a time, and we would miss them horribly when they left. But he, one, once they came to visit us, and he said, do you remember the the night when we were all sitting at the dinner table and Papa got up and he went around and did this to each one of us. He touched each one of us on the head and then Gerard said he never hugged us. That's the only time he ever touched us. So I, this man loved me and took care of me and I, he walked on water. <laughs> you did get really lucky. Yeah, I got so lucky. So there were other children, like Anne Frank, and I, these are my words. I called her hiding closed. She was in a closed hiding. Um, she never had a breath of fresh air unless she opened the window. I guess at night. Um, they had to be quiet as, and not make a peep all day long because they were above the offices of 
a company her father started. So they couldn't make a sound with all those people living in that um, upstairs home. Well, they made a home out of very crowded quarters. I could make noise, but I, I was very good. I think all hidden children were very good because somehow we knew that life was serious in a way you would never feel that we didn't misbehave because any number of us could be turned out on streets, you know, onto the street and, and, have, and be homeless. And many Jewish parents had to pay people to take in their children. And with my Funderbrink family, there was no money ever exchanged. They just did it because it was the right thing to do. And then there were other children who went from house to house because they were so mistreated. And if the people got scared that the Germans might discover a hidden child in their midst, they, they were afraid for themselves, so they would get rid of the child. And in the nicer cases, they would try to find another home. But in some instances, children were badly mistreated um, in many, many ways. So we all had a tendency to be very well behaved, but I was the lucky one. You were the lucky one. Um, the Vanderbrinks just, uh, Vanderbrinks sound wonderful, and uh, I know that there were times when they, they hid you because you had German soldiers coming and searching. Right. So we had a lot of house searches because we were in a heavily occupied part of Holland. In fact, somewhere nearby was uh, a German, a Nazi living with his family, kind of across the street. Uh, so it was all very tricky. And the question? was <laughs> yeah, oh, how, did, how did they hide you oh how did they it, protect so you so often the germans came to look for jews they 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 did house searches <clears throat> sometimes they just wanted to take what what they saw and sometimes you know like food or blankets they took all our blankets and it was freezing in holland in the winter so um Often they came on searches for Jews. And then, of course, everyone would be at risk of, with their lives. And this was a daily fear, and it happened frequently. Sometimes when the Germans came, the neighbors would have advance notice, and it would be a little like telephone or telegraph, and somebody would get word to the next house that they were coming. And in, in such cases, the Funderbrinks, whoever was home, would throw me in a bed and put a blanket and, and cover my head and tell the, the Germans that I had TB. They were terribly, terribly, well, I think they were petrified of co communicable diseases. Um, and they ran. And it was a very big laugh because they really got rid of them that way. Uh, they ran out of the house. Well, they ran out of the room because that, and they covered my hair so nobody would see that it was dark, not, not the typical family type. And other times they came and there would be no advance notice. And for some crazy reason, I will never understand, maybe it was something of the times they would throw me in a corner of the living room, oh, and there was a dunce cap, and they would cover me <laughs> with a dunce cap. And uh, this is all in the video. <laughs> yeah. And they, they would just point <laughs> to, to me. And uh, for some reason, they didn't pay attention to me, but we, we got away with this. Uh, I don't know how often. <laughs> it gave us good laughs afterwards. <laughs> so it'd be like you got over on that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, wow. Well, as, as the war descends, it starts out and you, there are such, you know, it's sort of segregating the Jews from other, yeah. the other population, and then it gets really intense. Um, it, it, it just, the, most of the Jews are already gone, but the war has moved into Holland and it gets bleak. Right, and that was in 1942. It, it became a choice to disappear, which in Holland was not easy. If you think of a very, very small country that has the North Sea on one side, Belgium on the southern border, Germany on the eastern border, and then just the North Sea all around. There were no caves, and, and the size was small, and the population was so divided between German collaborators and um, really decent, wonderful Dutch people, the other half of the coin. So you either had to have friends. Now, my family fled Germany the year right after Hitler was voted into power. They left immediately and they fled to Holland, <coughs> which took in any, I'm sorry about <laughs> having to drink water to keep my voice going. Um, a number of Jews in Germany fled to Holland. The, uh, the Frank family and uh, quite a number of others. Uh, and they, they got a footing in Holland, like my mother and father f had to find jobs uh, because they couldn't take any of their belongings, their monies. Uh, they had to leave everything behind in Germany and start <clears throat> all over, and they had no connections. So they worked, <clears throat> my mother, I think had a very nice employer and she worked as a secretary and they gave her very nice clothes for me um, because I was quite a well-dressed little child. Mm -hmm. but, so there were nice people around and my father worked, I think he was working as a taxi driver and um, in a movie theater that he was able to be a part owner, but they came from a German middle class and now they were scrounging, you know, just, and the house they were able to buy, I, I guess they bought a house, they turned into a boarding house so that the family actually slept kind of in the kitchen and wherever. Um, so uh, times were very challenging, but they managed. And in 1942, oh, this is where I wanted to begin. The miracle of my being here is not only because so few Jewish children survived the Holocaust, but it was also the very kind of the meaning of why I want to speak to you uh, because in bad times, which we are facing in many ways, I mean, we are not in a Holocaust, but I would say that our democracy has proven to be very fragile and that we have to really work to save it. And this is a terrible thought, but I, I am here because other people have the courage to take action and the courage to speak up. So it starts with the courage of my parents to send me away on, on that stranger's bicycle. They didn't know her either uh, because of this, the secret nature of the times. It continues with the courage of the underground workers who were the opposite of bystanders they took action, and then it, go, it continues with the Funda Brinks who risked 
eight of their children and themselves to take me in and all the other people who did that kind of work. So the fact that I'm alive is really because people stood up and proved their courage and, and took action. <clears throat> and that goes, it really hits a very deep vein within me that they could do that if you imagine, if you were in this situation, what could any of us do? What kind of commitment? How did the Thunderbrinks know whether they were taking me for a week or a month? And it, you know, it ended up being four years that I was there. And the family, the children, there are eight of them. Five of them are boys. They're also the age where they could be conscripted, right? So that's an added danger. It's an added danger because the Germans also would want to pick these boys up. They were all at that age and they were strong. Well, we, I don't know how strong they were towards the end of the war because uh, of the hunger winter and the very, very difficult times everyone had to go through. Um, but yes, I thank you, because I, I wanted to make that point. You know, there were more bystanders, and all these bystanders who just turned the other way while there were, this is going to shock you, but it has been written in the New York Times, so I'm, I'm not making the numbers up. This, this has been a proven fact. 42,500 concentration camps slash ghettos throughout Europe. Mm -hmm. You know of some of the big names, possibly. Some people never heard of the Holocaust, so they don't even know what a concentration camp is. But imagine 42,500 and that no one knew what was going on. Uh, so mm -hmm. this really illustrates how many people were standing by and turning the other way. And so it's important for me to tell you these things so that collectively we, we could know danger signs and maybe keep such things from happening again, though we watch other genocides throughout the world and I don't know what to say. That was it, no? That was well said. Um, I'm curious too to poll like Renee for many years, like like many people who've lived through a trauma or a war, kept silent about it for a really long mm. time, even from their families. So at, at in the '90s, you decided to start speaking, and I was wondering what what was the catalyst for that? And oh, you're you're just you're amazing, me because <laughs> you're really. I'm interested. <laughs> it, it's drawing all this out of me, and I, I couldn't sit here and without sidetracking, keeping any sense or rhyme or reason. In 1991, something truly amazing happened. And because I never told anyone um, until 1991, that I lived through the Holocaust. I always felt different. I felt I didn't belong anywhere, but I never understood what it was. And then there were all the years when you tried to get your life moving forward, and you marry and have children, and you don't allow yourself to pity yourself or think too much about all this, and you just kind of put it away. 
So I never talked to my children. For some reason, the whole thing was embarrassing, partly because I was shy. And the Funderbrinks instilled this deep humility that you don't draw attention to yourself. So, you know, this is really a departure for me to talk about myself because we couldn't, we were never the center of attention. It, it just, it wasn't a humble behavior. So I put everything away and 1991 came and some friends sent me a clipping that was tiny <clears throat> in small print from a Jewish newspaper, friends from New Jersey where we lived for a very long time. Um, and they said, could this be you? Because no one knew. But I don't even know why they thought it might be me. And it was a little, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, it was a little announcement about an international world meeting of hidden children in Manhattan, which is New York City, and it was to be at a very, very large hotel. And my friends said, could this be you? And I still don't know why they have the idea. My children, I had never spoken to my children about it. And my husband probably explained things to our children, but I never entered into those conversations. <clears throat> so I thought, I have to go. I went to New York. And my daughter and son-in-law did live very nearby. So I, but they brought me into town. And I walked into the hotel. And I saw all these people my age greeting each other and chattering away in French and, and other languages. And I just wanted to go through a hole in the floor because I felt I don't belong I don't belong anywhere, and I don't belong here. It turned out that there were 1,600 child survivors, hidden children, in this Marriott Marquis Hotel. And a lot of them were from Holland. And we had first aid stations. Did you know that part of it? The first aid station were psychiatrists in case people had absolute breakdowns. And outsiders were not welcome, not reporters. And yet it was on television. It was everywhere in the New York news. But we were in it, so we didn't see the news. I mean, it wasn't of us, but just um, there were workshops. There were plenary sessions. And we kind of found out we had a family of 1,600 fellow hidden children. And um, it was the most amazing experience. And we were in some of these plenary sessions with world famous speakers who were magnificent. And I can't remember who was there at that conference. We were told <coughs> that as the last um, what, there are certain ways of phrasing this, but as the last living generation to have borne witness to the Holocaust, it was now our mission to go out in the world and speak. So I thought I was so shy that I could never do this, but we had to. So I think many of us have, have begun to speak about it. And th through those conferences, I have come to know other people who were also hidden. No one had my experience. I didn't have theirs. And through that, I've come to know so many ways of hiding and so many ways of being found. Like I have a friend whose parents said in a train station,
please, to, to a total stranger, please take our baby. Another, a good friend of mine, a very close friend, who lived but with his mother and father in a chicken house. And um, a friend who was put in a coal bin, under the coal, he was buried in coal, um, because that was the way we, we had heat and fuel. Um, and they hoped that he would be found in time because, I, I don't want to repeat myself, but that's in, in the other chapters of the video. The Germans would poke in bayonets into coal bins to kill Jews who might be hiding in the coal. So he luckily was found in time and you know, we're very good friends today. He lives in Arizona. And then another one who was thrown out of a train by her mother on the way to the camps because at least she had a chance that way. Um, children who were thrown out, they had all kinds of horrible stories. And we come back to how lucky I was. Mm -hmm. We so, do keep coming back there, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> I'm grateful. <laughs> Renee, those are, I, when I heard you tell those stories on the documentary, I didn't know that those were the stories of people who lived. Those were all people who lived. The, the child that was thrown from the train the lived. The child who was thrown from the train always walked with a limp. But she lived. But she did live, which is amazing. And uh, Flipia, his name is Phil, his nickname is Flipia. They called him Coal Flipia because coal is the same, and his insides and his outsides were black mm -hmm. for a few days. <laughs> he lived, yeah. He lived. Well, one of the great stories about you surviving is, is Aviel's question from before we even got in here tonight, when he asked, do you have children? Oh, yes, right? and then, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have two children. I was married. I was married for 45 years, and um, my husband died. And then I was on my own. Um, my children were grown, but he died young. And um, my children do know about me <laughs> now, but not from me. Uh, so they know what they know, and. Um, they went on to have children of their own. So I have two children and five grandchildren and a partner for nearly 10 years. Mm -hmm. So my life is very nice, and he's a very nice man. <laughs> 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 Some of the time, most of the time. But so we, we all have our tales. We all have, we're all imperfect people. Well, I did promise them that you would talk about your grandmother, and you have an amazing story about her coming to see you. Coming to see me while I was in hiding. Well, first, I worship my grandmother, but, you know, in a healthy way. Uh, she was my giggle partner. We laughed. My grandmother was, she suffered so much tragedy. She had three children, and Two of them were murdered in the Holocaust, so one lived. Um, and she was always there. She was always together. And she believed in behaving like the queen. Well, you know, you have to think back that my grandmother was born in 1884. And just being born so long ago comes with its own baggage of behavior. Uh, they didn't go around dressed casually. Everyone dressed well every day. And you behaved like the queen. But um, she was on the run during the Holocaust. She tried to be one step ahead. Well, there are many stories about my aunt and my grandmother um, because there were safe so-called, at the beginning, there were safe houses. They wanted to contain the Jews so that they could round them up later on. 
and the first step was to round them up and place them in ghettos so that they had control. And then they controlled that many things about lives, our lives. We couldn't eat eggs. We couldn't have eggs. And I don't know what any of this meant um, because I was so little. But my aunt and my grandmother were on the run separately because it wasn't safe to be together. And nobody would, it was easier to find a place to hide if you were alone. So they were in the east of Holland, hours and hours or days walk, two days walking maybe. Uh, and my grandmother knew where I was hiding. And for my birthday in December, which is a very brutal month in Holland, the weather is not easy there. Um, she came from the very east of Holland and walked two nights and hid in the daytime because she, you know, the Germans, you had to have identification papers. You were stopped constantly and you had to show your papers. And if you weren't, if you didn't have false papers, you would be sent away immediately. Uh, there was a transit camp in Holland, so you would first be sent to that transit camp. So my grandmother um, had to hide in the daytime, I don't know, in ditches or in the forest, and walked two nights and appeared on my birthday. And I was, maybe it was my fourth, maybe it was my fifth birthday. I would guess my fifth, and it was my grandmother. And it was the most wonderful thing in the whole world for me. But then she had to leave so quickly and get back because it wasn't safe, and she couldn't do that to the family. Um, it's unforgettable. And after the war, we were happy together, the two of us. And we giggled, and we laughed. And we went hungry, and we went to the woods every day and, and collected mushrooms. And she made a kind of cheese that I couldn't eat, no matter how hungry <laughs> I was. Uh, but my grandmother knew how to manage in every occasion. And I still, I don't know how she knew everything. She could do everything. So that's my grandmother. And I, I do break into a big smile when I think of her, when I think of the Funda Brinks. I have nothing but, you know, inward smiles. It just. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that's so interesting about Holland is, like you said, there's this two sidedness to the country. There were, the, there were many collaborators, but there were over a million people who ignored. The, they knew that there were people hidden, and they just pretended like they didn't know. Right. But that's why my hiding was very carefully orchestrated. I didn't, could not go to school. I was an illiterate person until I was close to nine years old. Um, there were no books around, and the, the paper and pencils didn't exist. And I was safe to go to a nursery school, which was more a babysitting service. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was safe there because, well, they called it a Montessori school, but you know, nothing was going on except keeping us there. Like we would, the nuns combed our hair at noon every day because we all had lice, lice. We had worms, we had fleas but the lice and the worms and styes everywhere around our eyes, we were all covered. We were not exactly appetizing. So, but it was safe for me to be in that school because the, the teacher was my oldest sister, oldest Catholic sister's best friend. So she wouldn't talk. And I went there. And we did nothing except knit. So we had little bits of string, maybe this long, string or wool. 
and we had knitting needles, and I got to be a very fast knitter. But every time we ran out of wool, we unraveled it. We did this for three or four years. <laughs> we didn't do anything else except my chores at home. Mm -hmm. And Very I was a little late learning to read and write. But you got there. <laughs> well, I'm a slow reader. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Renee, I think that um, we, have, I, we could hear a pin drop. Everybody was listening so closely and intently. <laughs> I'm wondering if anyone has questions that they would want to ask Renee. Please. Yes. I think we've got. You'll just raise your hand and I'll come to you. I was. So <laughs> how old were you and how did you come to the United States? Um, how old was I when I came to the United States? <clears throat> I, um, I was 10 and a half, and I was really happy in living with my grandmother because I went to school, I had girlfriends, and I got to play outside on the street with girlfriends. We did jump rope and hopscotch and frog, leapfrog or whatever. And then one day my grandmother said that I'm going to America in a boat. And I had a terrible fear of the water. And I thought the boat would be, you know, like a little <laughs> paper <laughs> boat you might fold up and float in the water. I, I didn't know what a ship was, so I didn't want to go to America in the worst way, and I didn't speak any English. Um, but my grandmother and I went on this ship it's, it was a big ship. And um, then she went back to Holland, but it was 1948, and I was 10 and a half. I was born at the end of 1937. And then I, um, my grandmother and I stayed in somebody's apartment in, in New York City, in Manhattan. She had been a refugee from the Holocaust, and she was able to flee Germany, the woman whose apartment where we stayed. She came from a very upper class family and was a very fine lady, and she was a family friend. When she came to America, she worked as a cleaning woman for a very wealthy man who lived on Central Park South. That, that's an address where you would like to live. And so she was going to Europe in 1948 and gave us her apartment. And my grandmother and I lived there, I think, for two weeks. And every day we went together to the zoo in Central Park. And, and she left a cake for us. It, it was beyond magic. And then I met this strange, I mean, a family, they were strangers to me. And they came to get me. First, they took me to a musical on Broadway with their own daughter. It was Oklahoma, and I didn't speak English, and I've hated musicals ever since. <laughs> <laughs> and I just cannot turn my head around. So then we went on a 10 plus hour trip to their house in the Adirondack Mountains, and I got to live there. And they didn't speak Dutch. And the first night we got there, they told me it wasn't a language, it was a throat disease. And then they had a really good laugh about that. But I understood German, and they, they spoke German. So, I mean, well enough so they could speak to me, and I had some understanding. So it didn't start out too well. Yeah, in some ways you say that surviving survival was harder. I went downhill from there. <laughs> yeah, surviving survival. I was a happy, basically, no matter what was going on, no matter how hungry we had chill blains, I mean, it wasn't pretty to be in war and to be so frightened and to be spending time in the 
bomb shelter, which in reality was nothing but an apple cellar. Um, and to go hungry, we ran out of dandelion greens and we ate tulip bulbs and um, flour mixed with water. But, you know, everybody was doing the same thing, so I didn't feel any sadness or I didn't feel unlucky because when you don't know anything else, it's okay. We didn't have shoes. We, we didn't have clothes. I mean, we had rags, kind of. And the shoes were funny. Um, we all had sneakers. And so we were all growing. And they cut the toes out. And our feet would keep growing, but we kept the same sneakers. <laughs> and wow. we managed, and I was happy. But um, coming to America didn't go too well for me because I was never again loved. I, I would become an inconvenience for having survived to wherever I stayed. So I took to running away, and I went back and forth between <clears throat> two houses. I was really unhappy. But then I got very lucky in life again. So I, I married someone who loved me, and my grandmother loved me, and um, to give and receive love is about the best anyone can ask for. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to bore you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Do you have, I think people will probably want to have more questions. Oh, more questions. Mm -hmm. How did you hear about the the end of the war and when the occupation ended? That oh, it was a big, well, it was a small town and a big noise and everybody screaming, the war's over, it's ended, it's ended. And we ran, <clears throat> we all ran to the center of town. There was a town square and, um, if, the, if that square in that town is kind of well known, um, we all ran and people danced around in circles and they sang and it was glorious. And then we woke up the next morning and we were cold and we were hungry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was May, so we weren't cold. But the family sent me. I was chosen from... <clears throat> all, well, the mother had died in one of the worst bombings, but while we all ran into the bomb shelter, we had to leave her behind. And we, none of us ever got over that. But um, at the end of the war, there was one person from every household who could go to a designated place in, in the village and get bread from Sweden white bread, like snow. Mm -hmm. It was as white as snow. Uh, today, maybe it would be more like Wonder Bread, and I don't <laughs> think I would enjoy it as much. But no, it was more like homemade white bread. And we just smelled it and tasted it. <laughs> it was the most beautiful thing in the world. So we got that loaf of bread, and we all sang and we danced and we cheered. I do remember that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so do you still keep up with all your Dutch friends that you met in Manhattan? And have you been back over to, to Holland? Um, they're two, they're, they're like two different things. Um, many of the people I met at that first conference have died. And the conferences today are continuing, but they're mostly what we call 2Gs, the second generation, and even 3Gs running them. And when I speak to one, one of my surviving friends is stone deaf, so we can't speak on the phone or we, we email. 
Um, it's kind of sad. I am in touch with just, well, I can't flip you, Ruth. Uh, there are a few, but such a small number, and the others have all died. Um, my family, all my siblings have died, except, I don't know, I have, <laughs> you want me to read that later. I, yeah, um, this is good. My, seven of my eight Catholic siblings have died, but their children and I are now very close. Not, not, I mean, when one brother in Australia has 13 children, I can't tell you that I know each of his 13 children intimately, <laughs> but I feel close to quite a number of those 13. And then um, very close to two nieces from one of my other Australian brothers, and so on and so forth. And my three Dutch sisters who stayed in Holland, I love their children, and I think they really love me also, and there are some I'm very close with, as close as I am with my own daughter. And she, the one I'm closest with, and keeps really in touch with me, and every, not every year, but occasionally on May 5th, when we remember the end of the war in Holland, she calls me. And, um, she has been in foreign service, so she's in different countries around the world. And she has um, organized two family reunions, and the first one, Horace went with me. It was the most memorable. It was unbelievable, unbelievable. And um, people in the family came from Australia, from England, and I don't know where else, but from all over Holland. Mexico, three, family of three from Mexico, yeah. And I don't know how many people there were, but we have a picture of all of us in one photo. And it was exciting, so exciting. And then Marion, the one who organized that, did another reunion in Australia, and I, went to Australia, and that was just, just before COVID. And then my youngest brother from Holland, who is the only one still living, wrote his recollections of childhood at um, 21 Lingenscombe, excuse me, in, in this town where I was hidden, where we lived. And <coughs> you yeah. think it's okay? Mm -hmm. His name, his nickname is Beppe. Uh, one day, my dad took me aside. Now, this is the very stern dad. Um, took me aside to speak to me. I thought, what have I done wrong now? But he said, and quotes, tomorrow we are going to have a little girl come here, and she's going to be your little sister, and her name is Rita. And if anyone ever asks you about her, you must always say she is your sister. So this is my youngest hiding brother. And then he said, the next day, a little dark brown haired girl came and she would sit at my dad's left side at the dining table while I was on the left of mama. On the opposite side, and my three sisters next to Rita and Mama and the boys on the other end of the table. And he goes on about how the boys were pigs and the girls only wanted to have one <laughs> boat of gravy and let the boys have the other. It goes on and on. But it's, it's so sweet that that's his recollection of childhood. So yeah, it is really he cool. learned English in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> The moment that you came, he remembers preparing yes, for the I moment. <laughs> he was afraid of his father. <laughs> I loved it. I got punished equally. So I was equal in that house, and I was happy. I think the, the way that they distributed bread shows that, too. Yes. Everything was equal. And 
it was a wonderful thing that I got punished also. You <laughs> <laughs> belonged. Well, you know, our punishments, I mean, I wasn't one of the boys who really got punished if he did something serious. Um, we had to stand at the top of a staircase to the cellar, and the Dutch are notorious for their steep stairs. You can't really fit a whole foot on a stair step. They're very narrow and very steep, because in Holland there's very little space. Um, and we would stand in a tiny triangle at the and then the stairs would just go down in a pitch dark at the top of the cellar <laughs> until Papa said time was up. Oh. oh, maybe it's the original time out. <laughs> <laughs> well, these are great questions. Yeah. We've got one right here. I'm currently a sixth grade teacher, um, so obviously educating the future generations. What is the most important thing that you think that the future generations need to know to hopefully either prevent this from happening again, or um, just what do you think they should know? What do you think is some of the most important things? I, I think they need to know the Holocaust happened and that it did not happen overnight. So by studying it, understanding how it came to be, and seeing the more subtle beginning signs, we would better know how to prevent it. I would like to, I won't see the day, but I would like to see the day when that becomes a reality. So it is, really important, I think, to study the Holocaust. Uh, there has never been a state-sponsored murder of an entire group of people. This is not a tribal war. It is not a war over boundaries. This is to eradicate every last Jew from the earth. So they did kind of with killing the people, they killed a culture which was very rich. Now there are efforts to bring Yiddish as a language back. Um, but I hope I answered the question because the, the relevancy, it's not to tell sob stories, it's to make it relevant to our lives today. Oh, and then I thought, I have to behave because Bill Bretman is watching this. <laughs> and I said, oh, because we live in the same place and we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, but not too much. You don't have to behave too much. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Did you have a question? I think we're good unless we have any more questions. Okay. If it's not too painful, could you tell us about what happened to your parents? I, I didn't um, find out until very much later in life. No one would talk. And um, then when I first heard, I dismissed it. I didn't hear it. I, I don't know, but they were murdered in Auschwitz. And the rest of my family, either Auschwitz or Sobibor, um, they went from the transit camp in Holland, which is Westerbork. You would pronounce it Westerbork. And it was in the north of Holland. And they collected the Jews to send them to the death camps. Um, so I, I guess that answers. I think the naming, this is maybe a, a good question to kind of pull a few things together. Um, names see, seem to keep coming up in the story, whether it was the name of the town you were born in as something that 
people from Holland could use to tell if someone was German because the Germans would always mispronounce it. Oh, the name it. of my birth, the birthplace, which was... But also your names. Oh, my you names? Know, they don't know about all the names you've had oh. either. <laughs> oh, as I said, I was married once. I had three first names and f I'm on my fifth last name. Um, <laughs> And, you know, when I speak to school children, I say, but I was only married once. But um, I got renamed when I came to the Funderbrinks because my name was a little bit German, I think, Renate. So they named me Rita, which is a nice, good farm family girl's name. And um, then when I came to America, I was told that my name would be Renee. I, I was never consulted because children weren't. So um, that's the one I stayed with because my life has, in its instability, it's been stable, meaning I never changed my name again because I didn't have to move or run. Mm -hmm. um, but my birthplace, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's Scheveningen. And nobody but a Dutch person can say it. Now, I can say it like they say it in the city or like they say it where I lived with, you know, the farm family. Scheveningen, <laughs> Scheveningen, or Scheveningen. Um, the Germans couldn't say it, so it was a test word. Uh, they would say, pronounce this, and then they would know if it, the person was legitimate or not. There was not a German who could pronounce it. Um, I was misspelled on this. Oh, was it on the video? Okay. It's S C H, and they okay. spelled it S H. So that would in Dutch be Shavening, and but, and they misspelled my um, Catholic father's name. His name was oh. Johannes Geispertus van den Brink. <laughs> Or Geispertus Johannes. I get them <laughs> mixed up. I don't know which is first and which is next. This, is, this isn't really a question. I'm going to answer your question. I taught U.S. history in high school for a number of years. I'd never let them not know of what y'all went through in World War II. And I think we're living in a time now that people are trying to shade it out and not talk about it or whatever. But I think it needs to be talked. I think it needs to be heard. And I, I hope some of my students still remember that because mm -hmm. I lived through World War II, so I know what you went through. And I thank you. I, I tell you that, that my wife and I and my sister are here today, and I imagine everyone in here feels the same way. Don't let that ever disappear from history because it tells us that we've got to, we've got to do this. We've got to remind people of these things because it can happen again if we don't. So that I just tell you, teach it should, teach it. <laughs> teach it. I like that, teach it should, teach it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, what will we do with such an experience as we have shared tonight? The true test of the power of a story is found in the actions of its listeners. Can we practice in our ordinary lives ways to dignify each person we meet? For in that habit, we may be able to pass the test of sharing the last our, our food with a stranger, of hiding someone in the face of, of this extreme danger, and to live like the righteous among the nations as though there are universal moral laws that bind all humanity together. With the deepest gratitude, we thank you, Renee, and I hope you can hear how much you've inspired us. You were so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you.
We thank you all. Thank you all. I'm sorry if I went down too long. <laughs> it was, I, I think you could have heard a pin drop. Everybody was completely riveted. Thank you. I don't think I've ever told this much. You told, you, I heard things I had never heard before. I surprised myself. But it's you wonderful. were so conducive, you bring it out in people. We should go on the road. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so there. <laughs> we can take some teachers, too. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for coming, and please come say hello. We will we'll come down there so we can be close to you. you know, I have never been treated with such, gee, this has been a night to remember. This really. has been a night to remember. Alice for me and I too. hope we never lose touch. Me too. But really?